Well, let's begin here. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Dick Milius. I'm the chair of Alaska Common Ground. I'd like to first welcome you to tonight's discussion of Ballot Measure 2, the Elections Initiative. The initiative will appear on the November 3rd ballot, or if you already have received your ballot in the mail, you'll see it there as Ballot Measure Number 2. If you are voting by mail, make sure to get your ballot mailed well before November 3rd. On November 3rd, I'll be working the polls at Airport Heights School, and based on what I have seen, the Division of Elections is making sure that all polling places are adequately staffed and taking extra precautions to ensure everyone can vote safely in person. Information on early voting is available on the Division of Elections website, which starts, early voting starts on Monday, Soon? October 19th, this coming Monday. Tonight's discussion is on ballot measure two. Last Tuesday, we had a similar debate on ballot measure one, the oil tax initiative. A recording of that is available through our website and Facebook page. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors, League of Women Voters, Youth Vote, and Anchorage Library for their support. Our co-sponsors' roles were very limited to helping spread the word about tonight's event. The co-sponsors had no role in setting the agenda or selecting panelists for tonight's debate. Additionally, this event is supported in part by a grant from the Alaska Humanities Forum. So we thank the Alaska Humanities Forum for that. We cannot conduct the work we do without the support of our members. If you would like to support events like this, please be consider becoming a member or making a donation to Alaska Common Ground. And you can find a link will be posted I think momentarily on the chat function to show you where to sign up or donate. Here's a few Zoom slash housekeeping and uh, other rules here. This is our second public Zoom meeting with a large number of participants. So we thank you for your patience if we encounter any difficulties because we're still in the learning curve on operating these Zoom events. Everyone's audio and video has been muted during the meeting, except for the presenters. Please leave your audio muted. This is a listen and watch Zoom event with several hundred people on. There's no way we could have everybody trying to weigh in speaking. The meeting is being recorded in case you or your friends wish to watch this later. The discussion is scheduled to run until nine o'clock. If members wish to provide questions for panelists during the debate, we are taking questions through Zoom's chat feature, which is being monitored by board member Katie Doherty. The chat box is at the bottom of your screen. At last week's debate on ballot measure one, we had a vigorous side discussion on the Zoom chat. A number of our audience members found this chat debate within a debate to be distracting. So we request you limit chat to questions, or you can also use chat the chat feature if you are having uh, difficulty, um, technical difficulties and need some help. And also if you encounter technical difficulties, you can call or text, I should say text, not call, Kari Gardi at 529-2265. Again, 529-2265 if you're having technical difficulties, can't hear uh, or any have other, or lose connect, of course if you lose connection, um, you can call us on that number as well. Um, I will quickly run through the debate format. We will start with a summary of ballot measure one. Next, each side will have two speakers speaking for six minutes each, one speaker for, one speaker against, second for, then the second against. This will be followed by a three minute rebuttal by each side. After rebuttals, the panelists will ask questions of the other side. They will each have two to three questions to ask. This will be followed by audience questions that are submitted on the Zoom chat. We will not take questions verbally. Finally, each side will make a two minute concluding statement and that should bring us to nine o'clock. I am happy to introduce tonight's moderator, Thea agnew Bemben. Thea grew up in Anchorage. She is the managing principal and co-founder of Alaska Beck Consulting, a planning policy and community development firm based in Anchorage. Thea is an experienced facilitator of decision-making dialogues on a wide range of public policy issues. Thea will introduce our speakers, and with that, I will let Thea take it away. Great, thank you, Dick. Uh, great to be with you all tonight. Uh, thank you all for joining, and good evening to all of you. 
As Dick said, my name is Thea Agnew Bemben. I uh, am one of the principals at Agnew Beck Consulting, and I'll be moderating our discussion tonight. I wanted to start us off by uh, sharing with you, those of you who don't already know it, what the mission of Alaska Common Ground is. The mission statement says, we are here to engage and inform diverse citizens to cultivate understanding and cooperation on issues important to Alaskans. And I also wanted to share one of Alaska Common Ground's goals, which is to be a trusted resource for information and civil public dialogue that seeks consensus, identifies solutions, and encourages implementation. When I think about that, I'm so grateful to all of the volunteers who are part of Alaska Common Ground and who give their time and their expertise to provide this service for all of us Alaskans. And I think it's especially valuable right now that we can come together and trust that we have a, a fair and neutral platform on which we can share our different viewpoints and discuss those views with each other in a civil way. So that's really our goal for tonight. We're gonna to have a fair and civil discussion to help all of us learn more about the critical issue of how, to, how we should elect our representatives and leaders in our state. Uh, but before we start with the panelists, uh, we'd really like to hear from you. So we have a polling question that should soon show up on your screen. And I can see it on my screen. Hopefully you can see it on yours. And the question that we would love your, your response to right now is have you already made up your mind on how to vote on ballot measure two? So please take a minute to vote on Zoom. And while you're doing that, I would like to introduce for you the panelists who'll be joining us tonight. Uh, speaking in support of ballot measure two, we have Scott Kendall. Scott serves as the counsel to the Yes on Two for Better Elections campaign. Scott is an attorney at Holmes, Weddell and Barcott, and he most recently served as chief of staff to then governor Bill Walker. Um, for many decades, Scott has worked across Alaska. I guess I shouldn't have said many decades. <laughs> I'm not sure how many decades. Uh, for decades at least, uh, Scott has worked across Alaska in a variety of legal, political, and consulting roles. So thank you for being here, Scott. Also speaking in support of ballot measure two, we have Andrew Halcrow. Andrew is a former state representative and a past president of the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce. Andrew is the executive director of the Anchorage Community Development Authority. So thank you for being here, Andrew. Uh, speaking in opposition to ballot measure two, we have Brett Huber, Sr. Brett has been a fishing guide in the Bristol Bay, Iliamna, and the South Central regions. He is a small business owner in King Salmon and Talkeetna. Brett ran a statewide nonprofit in Soldatna and has also worked in state politics. Brett is now focusing on defending Alaska elections as the campaign manager for No On Ballot Measure 2. So thank you for being here, Brett. Also speaking in opposition to ballot measure two, we have Anna McKinnon. Anna graduated from Service High School. She is the former executive director of Standing Together Against Rape. Anna is a founding board member of the Alaska Veterans Museum. She has served on the Anchorage Assembly and is a former state senator and is a co-chair on Defend Alaska Elections Vote No on Two. So thank you for being here with us, Anna. And thank you so much to all our panelists for joining us tonight. Okay, in just a minute, I'm gonna hand us back to Dick Milius, who will give us a brief explanation of the ballot initiative. But first, let's look at the poll results. So it looks like we're almost evenly split between yes and no. So about half of us have already made up our minds about how to vote on ballot measure two, and um, just under half, 48%, haven't yet made up their minds. So we'll be asking the same question of you at the end of the uh, discussion tonight to see um, if this has helped you make up your mind or not. Uh, so with that, I will put myself back on mute and hand it over to Dick. Okay, um, I first need to get to my screen share here. Um,
Did everybody see that now? Um, anyhow, I offered to give the overview because everybody who kind of is knowledgeable about this ballot measure is either for it or against it. Um, so I offered to kind of prepare an objective overview of the ballot measure. And if I say anything that's incorrect, I'm sure one of the panelists will correct me, but they have both seen the presentation. So um, hopefully they will not have any issues with it. But uh, I just need to make an adjustment here on my screen. Um, in terms of what a ballot measure is, a um, initiative petition is a process an initiative and a ballot measure are kind of the same thing. The ballot measure is basically how it appears on the ballot. The initiative is actually the name of um, what this particular action is, which is the process that people instead of the legislature may use to introduce and enact a law. So what we're talking about is enacting a law and it becomes state law if a majority of the voters vote yes. And this is allowed specifically under Article 11 of the Alaska Constitution. Okay, this is what the title of the act is as it appears on the ballot. An act replacing the political party primary with an open primary system at rank choice general election and requiring additional campaign finance disclosures. The initiative deals with three major topics, primary elections, general elections, and campaign financing and disclosures. The full text of the proposed law is 25 pages and has 74 sections. Sections two through 72 are primarily changes or amendments to existing state election laws. The initiative is very detailed, similar to legislation introduced in the legislature. And one of the reasons is that this initiative requires changes to multiple state laws in order to be implemented, including a number of ancillary changes to state election laws. If you look at the state election laws, there's specific provisions dealing with how you deal with state representatives, there's specific provisions for the governor, there's um, additional different provisions, for example, that deal with national elections. So it, when you start making changes, for example, the primary, um, those changes need to be reflected throughout all the statutes. If you really want to read the whole thing, you can find it starting on page 139 of the official election pamphlet. Um, that's the page number in the Anchorage Matsu version. So I know we have some folks in Juneau, so uh, I think their pamphlet may start it on it, but it's towards the back. It's be between the candidates and the judges in the election pamphlet. And it's also online at that link there, which is Division of Elections website and the, specifically the section dealing with petitions and initiatives. This is what um, will actually appear on your ballot. These are both of the ballot measures, ballot measure one ballot measure two we're talking tonight about ballot measure two and it, as you can see at the bottom of your screen or the bottom of the um, ballot measure on your ballot it will say yes or no which is basically uh, the choice that everybody has been asked um, and i don't expect you to be able to read what you see on the screen here um, this is i also don't expect you to read this whole thing but it, i'll focus on the three highlighted provisions this is the actual language on the ballot Again, the actual initiative is that 75 page document. Um, and this is basically the Department of Law's summary of it that appears on the ballot, Department of Law and Division of Elections, I should say. Um, anyhow, the first portion of it is this act would create an open nonpartisan primary where all candidates would appear on one ballot. So that's the first major provision of the initiative. The second is the act would establish ranked choice voting for the general election. And the third part of the initiative is the act would also require additional disclosures for contributions to independent expenditure groups and relating to the sources of contributions. And I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these. Ballot measure two establishes one ballot measure ballot for primary elections. And what this means is it will eliminate the existing party primary system. I think probably most people in the audience voted on the primary and you had a choice between a Democrat, um, Democrat and everybody else is the way it's actually described or Republican ballot. This would eliminate this and just get, everybody would have one ballot. The parties would no longer select their candidates for the general election. It would be entirely through the, um, the primary election. 
There would be one nonpartisan primary for governors, state legislators, U.S. Senate, and U.S. House. All candidates would appear on one ballot. Their political party affiliations may be shown on the ballot. It's, it's the candidate's choice is the way it's worded, I believe. The governor and lieutenant governor candidates must run as a team. And the four candidates that receive the most votes in the primary advance to the general election, which is where ranking occurs. So at the primary level, there's no rank choice voting. It's just simply vote for all the people on the list and the top four go on to the general election. And this primary election would apply to uh, elections for the, or yeah, elections for the governor, elections for state house, state senate, U.S. senator, and U.S. representative. The four candidates receive the most votes in the primary appear on the ballot. So this brings us to the second part of the initiative, which is ranked choice voting in the general election. And voters, normally it's just a yes, no choice. They will be given a choice of first, second, third, or fourth choice after each candidate that's on the ballot. And the voters rank the candidates, first, second, third, fourth. If one candidate receives 50% plus one vote of the first choice votes, the first go around, they are the winners. So um, that's pretty straightforward. If after the tallying of the first, second, third, and fourth um, yields no candidate with 50% plus one, the candidate with the fewest first choice votes is, is eliminated. Those people who voted for that candidate who's eliminated as their first choice would have their second choice voter votes redistributed among the remaining candidates. Mm -hmm. If that pushes somebody over the 50% plus one, then that candidate would be the winner. And then this process repeats, essentially could go through three cycles if it takes that long before one candidate gets to 50% plus one. Oh, okay. As I mentioned, um, the ranked choice voting would be used in the general election for the four candidates who received the most votes in the primary, which would be the governor, state house, state senate, U.S. senator, and U.S. representative. The ranked choice is also used in voting for the presidential candidates, but they didn't go through the primary process, so there could be more than four. Um, for example, this year, there's actually seven candidate, presidential candidates on the Alaska ballot. So if it's ranked choice was in effect this year, you'd have to rank from one through seven um, for the presidential candidates. The third part of the ballot measure deals with um, what is referred to as dark money. Dark money is the independent political spending made by groups that do not disclose their donors. Uh, Section 17 defines dark money. I won't read that because it's right there in front of you. And um, dark money and other campaign contribution provisions of the initiative do not apply to ballot measures. It only applies to uh, candidates. So the um, state representatives, the governor, U.S. Senate, and U.S. congressmen. So it would not apply to initiatives or referendums. Okay, the, the act would set new rules and penalties for campaign finance. Uh, there's, there's quite a few uh, provisions here. So I just kind of sum, sum them up. But basically what it says is, um, that an entity that spends to influence the election of a candidate and receives over $2,000 in a year from a donor must disclose all the receipts from the donor and their source. The donor must also report the donations and their source and the, the initiative also limits contributions for governor and lieutenant governor campaigns to $1,000 annually for individuals and $2,000 for a group. And then there's requirements in the initiative for disclaimers that would have to run when commercials are aired, whether it's on TV or um, on, uh, for example, on uh, the internet or whatever. And then there's um, some changes to, uh, there's the initiative results in political parties and then political groups getting different standing, primarily political groups than they currently have. So there's some changes to like, um, the requirements for state election board members in section two, changes to um, poll watchers, which allows candidates, not parties, to, uh, to sign poll watchers, and changes to qualifications of certain appointees to the Alaska Public Offices Commission, and then also some changes to absentee ballot counting board members. 
this one is a fairly detailed slide I won't get into, but it kind of shows why the initiative is so is as long as it is, which is that there's specific provisions that apply to specific candidates types. And in this case, these are the provisions that deal with special elections. So if you look at the bottom, um, that kind of sums up what all these provisions do, which is that existing state laws do not require a primary for special elections to fill vacancies, but the initiative adds both the primary requirement and rank choice voting to, for special elections. And that first section at the top there, sections 44 to 49, for example, are the provisions for special elections for US Senator and Representative. 50 to 54 is the provisions for filling an office of the governor position. Um, section 55 deals with appointments um, of legis vacant legislative seats and, and so on. So um, to, to make that one change, you have to go to all these sections because each section deals with a different uh, candidate group. Ballot measure two, including its finance provisions, do not apply to municipal elections. They do not apply to regional education attendance area elections, which are the school boards and the un unorganized boroughs, such as the Yukon Delta. They do not apply to presidential primaries, and they do not apply to yes, no ballot questions, which would be judicial retentions and initiatives and referendums. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Thea. Um, Great, thank you, Dick. Okay, so we're now ready to get into the discussion portion of our presentation tonight. So what we're gonna start with is a six minute presentation from each speaker. So the, uh, the side, the speaker who is speaking for ballot measure two will begin. Then we'll hear from the first speaker against the ballot measure. Then we'll hear from the second speaker for and the second speaker against and then each side will have three minutes to, to summarize. So I'm gonna be keeping time. I'll be making a, a chime sound when we get to five minutes to give the speaker a one minute warning. And then there'll be another chime when we get to the end of the six minutes. Before we start, I just wanna state the proposition that we're discussing tonight. So the proposition is basically, should Alaskans vote yes to pass ballot measure two? So starting with the first speaker who is speaking for ballot measure two, we have Scott Kendall. So I'll hand it over to you, Scott. And I'll start the timer as soon as you uh, start your presentation. Yeah, and, and someone on your team was gonna run the slide deck for me. So I assume we can share that up. Perfect. Okay, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so today we're gonna to talk about the problems with Alaska's elections. We've got a broken primary system. We end up with winners without majorities in the general. And we've got an ever increasing amount of dark money or anonymous money going through our election system. We don't know who's spending money to influence our votes. The solution to all three problems is a yes on two on, me on measure two. Uh, next slide. Problem number one, next slide is the broken primary system. So uh, next slide, Alaskans have to choose a party ballot instead of choosing the best candidates. Over 60% of Alaskans are not, are not affiliated with either major party, but they're all forced to pick a partisan ballot. They can't vote across party lines and they can't choose all the candidates their choice. And U's and N's who are candidates can't even appear on a primary ballot at all. Partisan primaries incentivize extreme campaigns and not solutions. It's a system built to preserve party control of elections and it shows because it drives turnout down. Turnout this year was 20%, sometimes it's lower. And what's worse is that low turnout is then divided between two separate ballots. So the bottom line is 6%, 5% of the electorate can decide who the winner is and that's often the most extreme five or 6%. And in a, a, part, a, a district that's slanted one way or the other, that five or six percent may in fact decide who wins the general election. This system punishes statesmanship and rewards division. Next slide, please. The solution. Next slide. All candidates would be on the same ballot. All voters get the same ballot, regardless of their party affiliation or lack thereof. You just simply vote for your favorite and the top four move on to the general election in every race. More choices on the general election ballot and the and the voters get the four best candidates. 
turnout will go up because now this is an election for all Alaskans, not just party insiders. Now public officials under this new regime would be incentivized to put forward real solutions. And if they don't deliver, they're accountable to all of their voters, not the partisan few. Next slide, please. Problem number two, next slide, is winners without majorities. Uh, next slide. Alaskans aren't governed by majority winners. No candidate has won a majority vote in US Senate race since 2002, and only five of Alaska's governors have ever won a majority. The result is candidates running negative campaigns. There's no focus on solutions. They're just fo focused on knocking down their opponent and turning out their own base. Another result is the spoiler effect. That's the idea that you risk support, that supporting the candidate you like the most might actually directly elect the candidate you like the least. And then what this ends up with is dividing the vote and candidates can win with 30%, 39%, 40%, even though a large majority preferred someone else. Next slide, please. So the solution, ranked choice voting for the general election. Next slide. Here's your ballot. You rank the candidates in order of your preference. The candidates are listed and you go across your number one. And if your number one candidate is in last place, then you simply have the option that your vote go to the next choice. Next slide, please. The benefits are clear. You get a majority winner every time. And although you get more choices, the spoiler effect is eliminated. Um, you get positive solution focused campaigns. Candidates need a true majority, not just their party base. And so if you can't run a campaign to 50% plus one of your electorate, why are you even running? This current system that we use, first past the post, is not how you make decisions in real life. If our first choice is not available, we often, we don't just decide to do the opposite. If you really need a truck, you don't go to the Ford dealership and look for an F-150. And if they're out of F-150 trucks, you drive off in a Ford Taurus. That's not what rational humans do. We go across the street, and we look at a Chevy truck or a Toyota truck, or we wait for it to get back in stock. The opposition will say this makes it too hard for people to vote, but we believe Alaskans can count to four. And finally, if you only want to vote for one candidate, you can, that's written into the law, and your vote will be counted just like it is now, and your vote will be treated no differently than if you voted in the current system. Next slide, please. Problem number three, next slide, dark money. So this is essentially political spending that we don't know the source of. Next slide, please. This graph shows you the problem of dark money. The true source there on the left is whoever earned or inherited the funds to be spent. Could be a company, could be a wealthy individual. The intermediary are entities that often exist only to launder money through them. And they have made up names. They could be Americans for apple pie, Alaskans for strong families. But that true source gives the money to the intermediary and the intermediary gives it to the independent expenditure group. You might also know those as a super PAC. It's basically an entity that runs a campaign that is not run by a candidate. And when they report who's paying for the campaign, unfortunately, under current law, all they report is the intermediary. The public doesn't know. Alaskans do not know who is paying to influence their vote. Next slide, please. So the solution, next slide, is to require transparency. And 81% of Alaskans agree, we deserve transparency in election spending. We have a fundamental right to know who is funding our campaigns. Next slide, please. The solution, ballot measure two, will require candidate campaigns to inquire and disclose the true source of every contribution. Any, con any donation over $2,000 is going to be disclosed within 20, $2,000 will be disclosed within 24 hours. None of this finding out in December who paid for the election Alaskans will know in real time. And another disclosure requirement will require any group that gets over 50% of its funding from outside to put that in their disclaimer, to say this organization gets over 50% of its funding from outside Alaska. Next slide, please. So you're gonna hear a lot about um, ballot measure two is unconstitutional. Okay, Scott, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna have to cut you off there because I actually gave you a little extra time already. Um, oh, I, did, I, I didn't hear the bell. I apologize. And oh, the, you didn't the, hear the first bell or the second bell? I didn't hear a bell. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, the citations are there. Um, and again, um, we've stated the problems and the solutions as a yes on ballot measure two. Apologies. Sir. 
Sorry. And that was my, my fault. I'll try and fix that for the next person. Thank you, Scott. Uh, now we're going to have our first speaker against ballot measure two, um, which is Brett Huber. So Brett, I'll give the floor to you. Yeah, and thanks to everybody from Common Ground that put this discussion together tonight. I appreciate the format and I appreciate the chance to share information. Ballot measure two is a 25 page, 74 section proposal being promoted by out of state billionaires. In fact, over 99% of their funding is from out of state. This initiative cobbles together two failed election experiments from the lower 48 and tries to impose this tangled mess on Alaska voters. So-called ranked choice voting requires voters to assign a score to every candidate on the ballot or risk having their ballot thrown out. Every candidate, whether you support them or not. The California style jungle primary will be imposed on Alaska voters. It throws all candidates into one combined primary and robs Alaskans of their ability to select political party nominees to compete against other candidates in the general election. Alaskans aren't better or worse if they choose to affiliate or if they choose to not affiliate. We're all Alaskans. The paid consultants the billionaires hired to sell ballot measure two will tell you that they're fixing flaws in Alaska's traditional time-honored election method. <clears throat> but as we'll discuss, Alaska doesn't have the problems they claim, and ballot measure two doesn't fix the problems they've invented. Our systems have been in place for over 250 years. It's normal, typical, and easily understood by voters. Their radical substitute is rare, unusual, complicated, and jam-packed with problems. Unlike our simple and transparent One Alaska, One Vote system, we believe ranked choice voting is not fair, not democratic, and not needed. Some votes may count many times, while some don't count at all. A confusing computer reshuffle decides the winner, and the candidate with the most votes doesn't always win. We believe this to be unconstitutional, and there are a lot of problems with this issue. The devil is in the details, and with 25 pages and 74 sections, there's lots of rooms for problems in litigation. In fact, Maine, the only state to use ranked choice voting, has seen four years of litigation already, and more to come as they're likely years away from a decision in the U.S. Supreme Court. This has been tried in about 20 jurisdictions. It's already been repealed in Birmingham, Vermont, Aspen, Colorado, Pierce County, Washington, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and all throughout North Carolina. Efforts are underway to repeal it in Maine, the only state that has adopted this RCV system. The reasons cited for repeal are the same as the reasons to vote no. Three reasons, ballot exhaustion, complexity, and lack of surety. Proponents will claim you only need to vote for one candidate. True, we've never denied this. Slide three, please, Tony. But if you've chosen, if your chosen candidate loses, everyone else gets to vote in the computerized instant runoff while your ballot is thrown out. It's like you never voted. Like those that voted for Bob and Greg. And if your chosen candidate wins, like Linda, with less than 50% in a four-way race, which will virtually never happen, your winning vote sits and waits for the contrived majority method to give the race to the candidate that finished third. Thanks, Tony. This system would require Alaskans to cast a vote for all candidates they disagree with or have, or, or have their vote not count at all. No more champions of your most important issues, be that education, gun rights, homelessness, jobs, healthcare, whatever. Instead, we'll have the least objectionable candidate that's taken no position on the issues as a winner comprised of a contrived majority, the candidate that says the least and smiles the most. In the Olympics, we don't give the gold medal to the athlete that finishes third. Why would we do so when picking our leaders? How big a problem is ballot exhaustion? Study from University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and Ohio State University found that ranked choice ballot exhaustion ranges from 10 to 27%. In San Francisco, despite having used ranked choice voting since 2004, 27% of voters effectively cast no vote in the 2011 mayoral election because of exhausted ballots. 55,000 votes that were counted and didn't matter to the outcome. There's no ballot exhaustion in Alaska now. We all get one vote and they're all counted once. The candidate with the most vote wins. We believe it to be fair, transparent, and easily understood. Our system has no tired ballots, no voters tossed aside, and every Alaskan vote counts the same. Our system makes sense, which is likely why the proponents have counted on over 99% of their financial support from outside billionaires, and why at only $18,000 of a $5.8 million campaign war chest has come from Alaskans. It's true, Alaskans are a mere rounding error in this hard sell scheme. So why are these out-of-state billionaires pushing it in Alaska? What do they want? Who are they? 
Three main billionaires are led by Catherine Murdoch of New York. Google them and decide if these are the folks we want controlling our elections. But what do they want? What are the billionaires really trying to buy? We believe it's time to send them a clear message in this election. Alaska is not for sale. These billionaires are doing the same thing across the country in smaller states like North Dakota, Arkansas, and Maine, where it's cheap to buy elections thanks to low populations. The proponents would have you believe they wrote this bill for Alaska. This is completely false. You can see the same language in Maine, Massachusetts, and now Alaska. It's a cut and paste job from model legislation written by their national group. Next slide, Tony. It's also been kicked off the ballot in two states, North Dakota and Arkansas, because the courts found that the paid signature gatherers didn't show petition signers the text. Have any of you seen the text? 25 pages, seems to be a pattern. This is not an Alaskan solution. It's not even an Alaskan idea. People have been absent in this process. No legislative hearings, no public participation. They didn't want your input, but now they want your vote. This effort appears to have begun with a couple of disgruntled politicians who failed to win election and a couple crafty political operatives. Our group, Defend Alaska Elections, Vote No On To, respectfully asks tonight's viewers and Alaskans across the state to turn down this misguided experiment and send these billionaires packing. We respectfully ask for you to vote no on ballot measure two. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I apologize, I, um, I think I got the chime right that time, but I, when Scott was speaking, I didn't have my mute unmuted. Uh, so I, I apologize for that, Scott. And thank you, thank you, Brett. Okay, so now we will have our second speaker for ballot measure two. Andrew, I invite you to take the floor. Good evening, fellow Alaskans. Uh, my name is Andrew Howcrow, and I am a recovering politician. Thank you for letting me into your homes to talk about Ballot Measure 2, which I am very passionate about due to my very personal experiences running as a Republican in the current closed primary system. Alaska is not for sale, Mr. Huber just said. On November 3rd, 1998, I was elected to the Alaska State House of Representatives. I was elected after a very contentious Republican primary. Two days after the election and on the same day as a freshman legislator, the House Republicans were scheduled to meet in order to elect the Speaker of the House and the rest of the House leadership. I was in my office, it was around noon, uh, and my phone rang. The voice on the other end said, Andrew, this is Bill Allen. At that time, Bill Allen was the most prolific Republican donor in Alaska's history. Every candidate was familiar with Bill Allen, head of VICO, power broker in the Republican Party, a literal maker and breaker of candidates. He proceeded to say, I donated to you, my executives donated to you, and we helped you get through a tough primary. In addition, my six-figure donation to the National Party that was then funneled through to the state party, helped save the House Republican majority in this year's election. He kept right on. Because of my support for you, he told me, I would like you to support Representative Pete Cott to be Speaker of the House. Now, I was speechless, right? I mean, I, I was a naive freshman that just got elected to the legislature. I, I, I was literally speechless, which is hard to believe considering that I am never speechless. I thought to myself, is this really happening? I mean, is this, this is the type of scene you see in some kind of sad political thriller. I told him, look, I, I appreciate your support for my campaign, but I think you, this call is way out of line and I have to go and I hung up the phone. Ladies and gentlemen, exactly 10 years later, both Bill Allen and Pete Cott were in jail, charged with an array of crimes, including bribery. That was 1998, and that was the standard game plan. The current primary system allows the creation of a dependent relationship between the donor and the party and the candidate. What happens next is what happens when any dependent behavior, uh, with any dependent behavior, it controls you and your behavior. Once elected, because the candidate wants to continue the support of the donor and the party and does not want to same, they, they don't want a primary opponent, uh, it, it alters their behavior. As a recovering politician, I can tell you that politicians up in a re-election year are a nervous group, like a bunch of long-tailed cats in a room full of rocking chairs. The threat of a primary opponent for incumbent that doesn't toe the party line is real. 
It changes behaviors, it changes votes, and it robs Alaskans of leadership when it needs it the very most. Let's forward to 2020, 22 years after I had this conversation with Bill Allen. The scales have become even more unbalanced in favor of political parties and undue political influence. Now in a closed Republican, it's not a few donors like Bill Allen working with the party to control candidates. It's outside groups aligned with the party that are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to manipulate the primary election. Just two months ago, politically aligned groups had dropped over $170,000 by July to put that into perspective, if you combined all other spending from all of the candidates during that same period, it would be $300,000. That means 30% of the total money spent during that short period was by politically aligned groups trying to pick candidates that would do their bidding. I mean, we have evidence that just surfaced three weeks ago when you heard the CEO of Pebble Mine bragging about how he was part of a group of donors who helped defeat incumbents in the primary because they were not aligned with his company's agenda. The problem with undue influence in closed primaries is real. It's getting worse and it's time to alter the balance in favor of Alaskans. Ballot measure two is not gonna cure all of our problems, but it is necessary to begin changing the current political power structure in favor of voters by providing more choices and more transparency. So please, you know, just remember, as this conversation progresses over the next three weeks, please remember the group opposing ballot measure two to reform elections are only concerned with maintaining the status quo and maintaining their power. They are only concerned about their power. They're not concerned about your power. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We will now have our second speaker against ballot measure two, Anna McKinnon. Over to you, Anna. Oops, you're still on mute. Thank you to everyone who's joining us here tonight. And Andrew, I'm sorry that I didn't have a chance uh, to work with you. Um, of course, I'm scripted for tonight, but your uh, passionate speech uh, begs me to actually insert some of my experiences that are very different than yours. I was first elected in 1999 and uh, went against a Republican and wasn't liked by the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Um, I was an unknown, a mom of two, advocating for my kids' school, local politics. Um, to the very end. I handed out uh, pieces of paper that were Xeroxed at the local Xerox machine and beat an incumbent. And I want, ran against PCOT before it was announced that there was anything corrupt going on, or I'm not sure if the offices were raided yet, but I beat PCOT in a primary as well. Um, people who donated to my campaign knew up front that I was an independent thinker and that they could not influence what I was going to do. In fact, lobbyists took me out to try to sway me. And when they tried to pick up the coffee or anything else, I laid my money on the table and very abruptly pushed back and told them right where they were with me that I was for the people and that I was going to be a voice representing the people. And they respected that, and that maintained through my entire career. It's never fun to beat incumbents or I don't take victory laps when I win an election. I'm humbled that voters came and supported me. And I remembered that every step of the way through my career. So I am so sorry um, that you experienced something different than I did. The party bosses didn't want me on the ticket but I won because the people put me on the ticket. Parties don't vote for elected officials, people do. And people cared when I came to their door and knocked and people cared enough to give me $5 or $50. And I won that first race with a, under $8,000. And now I look at this race. You know, I've, I've been in Alaska for 60 years. I've watched the races come and go and different parties going back and forth. 
whether it's political parties or outside influence. And I've got to tell you what's worst about this initiative for me is $5 million coming in to tell Alaskans what they need to do differently. But I, I respect you, Andrew. You have been involved in some incredible things and I respect the people on the other side of this um, debate. Uh, but for me, it's about one vote and one person and disenfranchising voters in different ways um, does not appeal to me um, in the sense that how you and Scott have described it. So again, back on my script, um, and I'll look forward to questions later, but uh, Tony, if you could put up slide eight, and I saw uh, people chat and asking for the slides to stay up a bit longer so that people could actually look at them. And I have a timer going, Thea, so I'm watching that I'm almost at four minutes. So for those of you following, there is a huge issue with spoiled ballots that can disenfranchise voters. I want you to think about this picture. It's a sample ballot from San Francisco and Berkeley. And I want you to remember this picture when the proponents of this measure uh, talk about the simplicity, because this is a very confusing ballot. And if you're a senior or if, you're, if English is your second language, you're gonna have a hard time filling this particular ballot out. And I'm not sure uh, if you remember, for me, I called it the hanging chads in the election, um, in the elections in Florida that decided one of our presidential campaigns or our presidential votes. Um, I, in my script, it's calling for uh, butterfly ballots, but I remember them as hanging chads in um, the Al Gore uh, Bush uh, presidential election. But the people who are advantaged most uh, in this are people who have the time to sit and read and review and look at all the candidates and all the issues that they represent and take the time like you are tonight to talk about these things. But we have um, on slide 10, another sample of research. So I like process and I like research. And that's why I like to hear from voters about things that are important to them. That's why I went knocking door to no door on every election. That's why for a decade, I tried to answer all of my own emails so that I would be connected with the people who voted for me and for those who didn't vote for me. Um, I had to work as a single mom, uh, multiple jobs to try to provide for my family. Uh, but people who don't have the time uh, to sit, or, sit and look are uh, sometimes those of a minority or those less affluent, those uh, in poverty. And, and so this research uh, shows that white voters are favored and rich voters are favored, wealthy, wealthy voters. In a discussion uh, research paper from Lawrence Jacobs, he's the professor at the University of Minnesota, he said that it leaves open a well-documented voting gap that favors white and influential affluent voters. The evidence shows a clear pattern. In Minneapolis, voters who are more uh, wealthy and whiter turned out at a higher rate. I'm sorry, Thea, I didn't watch my timer at the end. There, okay. there are lots more reasons, and if I could just close, we're concerned with suppressing minorities and those that are in poverty. We're, I'm okay. concerned. Okay, and I'm gonna cut you off because we'll have more time. Sorry, sorry to cut you off there. Okay, thank you so much. Great, okay, so now each side has three minutes to summarize their position. So we're gonna start that three minutes with Scott and I will start the timer when you start presenting. Thank you. Yeah, in, in response, and I just kind of want to respond to a couple of points here. There's no algorithm. There's no computer tabulating votes in a strange way. Um, imagine three stacks of votes for three candidates. There's four for one candidate, four for another, and two for the third candidate. What happens is you simply pick up that stack of two ballots and you look at what the next choice is for that person in last place, and those two go to one candidate, that candidate wins. Um, in terms of disenfranchisement, we've heard this, this false premise raised again and again. Well, here's the truth of it. The League of Women Voters in, in Maine polled the voters, 90% of them liked it, found it pleasant. They, they researched on whether there was an issue in terms of ballots dropping off. And what they found was successful voting was absolutely comparable and at the same rate of the current system. 
What's even more convincing, of course, is that the League of Women Voters here in Alaska has studied this ballot measure for six months, and they have found that it will actually empower more voters and enfranchise more voters. Don't take my word for it, take theirs. Another issue, they've talked about our funding, let's talk about theirs. We are disclosing and over-disclosing our donors. We're giving you information even beyond the groups that give to us, but the people who give to that group. No one too is receiving funds from the same entities that dropped a quarter million dollars into Alaska's elections in their primaries this year. This is dark money. RLSC, Club for Growth, Americans for Prosperity, dark money being used to fight dark money disclosures. Even worse, no one too was caught a few weeks ago hiding those sources from the public by the Alaska Public Offices Commission, claiming that their top three donors were actually three individuals that had given less than 1% of their funds. That's who we're fighting against. <clears throat> so in a nutshell, here's what they're telling you. Fewer choices is better for you as a voter. Don't worry about this. We'll present you with the two choices you're entitled to. But ask yourself, is the status quo working for Alaska? Shouldn't we expect balanced budgets, infrastructure, public safety, good schools? Bottom line, shouldn't we expect rational decision-making from our leaders? Most Alaskans think we're on the wrong track and rightly so. Big problems need big solutions. Big solutions only get reached when we come together as Alaskans. Rather than reward partisanship as the current system does, we would be rewarding statesmanship. Finally, ask yourself whether the voters or party operatives and special interests should con control elections that we pay for. Should we be in charge or should the parties? Elections are, should be run for the people's benefit, not the parties. These reforms will get more Alaskans involved, drive up voter turnout, and give all voters, every voter, regardless of party or lack thereof, more power and more choice. The best way to move Alaska forward is for the voters to take back control of their own elections and vote yes on two. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Okay. And now, uh, starting with Brett, you have three minutes. And go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ignore a couple of those just cheap shots from the other side. We'll deal with those in the question and answer. The proponents of this measure talk about politics over people. Our group, Defend Alaska Elections, Vote No On To, is comprised of Alaskans from around the state, of every political stripe, color, background, income level, and they're all fighting to ensure that Alaskans, not outside billionaires, are electing our leaders. The proponents of this measure have invented a problem and offer a solution that's proven in other locales that does not work and, in fact, can make things worse. History is often the best predictor of future events. Let's take a look at Alaska election history. In 1978, Dick Randolph was elected as Libertarian, first state House candidate in the nation. 1990, Wally Hickel was elected as governor on the Alaska Independence Party ticket. From 2007 to 2013, Alaska Senate was governed by a bipartisan majority. In 2010, Lisa Murkowski won an historic write-in campaign beating both the Republican and Democratic candidates. And in 2014, Bill Walker elected governor on the unity ticket. In our current legislature, the Alaska House is governed by a multi-party majority led by an independent speaker. And in our current election this year, you will find 16 candidates for state office that are nonpartisan or undeclared, in addition to candidates from the Republican, Democrat, AIP, and Libertarian parties. Our history clearly shows that Alaskans already choose diversity in our leaders. Again, history is often a predictor of future events. Let's look to San Francisco for a moment. They adopted ranked choice voting in 2002. Um, they've used it ever since 2004. Since 2004, their property crime's up 17%. San Francisco's now has got the highest property crime rates in any city in California. Since 2007, their homeless population has nearly doubled. Since 2006, the horrible drug overdose deaths are up 62%. Property crime, homelessness, drugs have all significantly increased since ranked choice voting went into effect in 2004. Would anybody say the residents of San Francisco are better off today than they were 16 years ago? I'm not suggesting that ranked choice voting caused those problems, but it has certainly not been the cure all the proponents that are suggesting. With the issues facing our state, now is not the time to try an experimental election system designed to reward candidates who say the least and smile the most. We need leaders that are not afraid to take a position. We need broad, diverse discussion of issues and ideas. We need to know our vote counts, just the same as our neighbors vote. And we need surety, transparency, and confidence in our elections. This proposal weakens all of those important necessities. Alaskans have strong opinions and respect those of our neighbor. We're a big, diverse, sparsely populated, and close-knit state. 
We aren't California, New York, or Colorado. We chose to be Alaska. We know and live, shop, worship, work, and interact with our elected officials, and we pick leaders that align with our issues and beliefs for a reason. Should this proposal pass, all that goes away. Alaskans deserve better than ballot measure two. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Brett. Okay, we're now going to enter the next section of the discussion. So during this portion, each side will have the opportunity to ask a question to the other side. So the way this will work is we will have one side, they'll have one minute to state the question, and then the other side will have two minutes for an initial response. And then the, the asking side will have a minute to follow up. And then we have a, a final minute for just a, a final answer. So we're taking about five minutes for each of these rounds of questions. We're hoping to at least get through two questions from each side, but we wanna make sure to leave time after this for the next section, which is when the panel will field questions from the audience. Um, so hopefully we'll get through two questions from each side. And um, we are starting this round uh, with the, the opposition. Sorry, I just look at my notes. So Brett or Anna, you have one minute to uh, state your question. And then Scott and uh, Andrew, you will have two minutes for your initial response. So go ahead and I'll start the timer when you start. Thanks, Thea. Uh, I'll take the first one. Uh, Scott, Andrew, uh, you have only uh, publicly disclosed three donors from out-of-state groups that fund over 99% of your campaign on the website. Uh, your disclosures include no amounts or names. You simply link APOC reports and provide no additional details. Would this be illegal under ballot measure two? If not, why are you giving voters the impression that value, ballot measure two will end dark money? So that, that's a great question, Senator McKinnon. And what you have to do is kind of go back in time to why do we have dark money? So dark money exists um, in, the, in the candidate realm because of the Citizens United case in 2010. And what that said was, even though it's a candidate campaign, you can spend unlimited amounts. Uh, money equals speech, so to speak. But that was just to do with candidate campaigns. Ballot measures always existed under a completely different statutory regime because there was always unlimited amounts of money allowed because the thought being, you can go look at a statute, you can read a statute, a statute can't be bribed. The statute will be what it is. So ballot measures existed over here and the great tectonic shift happened over here with Citizens United. That's the measure, that's the decision that blew a hole through disclosure requirements for all 50 states and all 50 states have struggled to keep up. And so Alaska, like many, most of the other states doesn't yet have stringent disclosure requirements to make up for that, to say, okay, well, where did this money really come from? I will say this measure just attacks the um, candidate part because that's what changed under Citizens United. Um, that's super important, of course, because of the influence as Andrew illustrated that that can have on public officials. Um, that being said, I would love to go back and uh, hey, in two years, if you and Brett would like to do the same thing for ballot measures on another ballot measure, I would love to do it. But, you know, already we've got the criticism of this thing being too long. Trying to expand it to a whole other regime would have made it another 10 pages long. I think it's an important issue, but the critical issue right now is who is influencing our public officials and who are they? When we disclose and we over disclose who our donors are, we're actually going beyond the law and kind of living up to the laws we think it should be to be an exemplar. We're not doing it because this would change that ballot measure two would change that. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And frankly, no one too isn't doing the same. Thea, is that all right if I respond? Yeah, go ahead. So you have one minute for follow-up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I would just say, Scott, that um, instead of in, in influencing uh, the initiative process influences the people of Alaska and $5 million from out of state um, uh, against, it, it feels a little bit like David and Goliath. Uh, however you want to describe that, that we don't have the same opportunities that you do because out-of-state money is coming in and 
putting in a really nice Cadillac uh, for everyone to look at. Your website is beautiful, but I know that you're complying with the law. I just don't agree that if you're going to campaign and say that we're trying to get rid of dark money, that we're only focusing on elections, which I, I agree that's what you've done. Uh, but dark money is rolling into the state right now and we're not able to see um, what is happening and who is actually influencing this measure and why why they want to spend so much money in Alaska it could be much better used in other ways right now. Okay, one minute for our final, final response. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it's a great discussion and I'd love to have it further. Uh, I will say ballot measure two was written 100% by Alaskans in Alaska. It was actually based off a couple of bills that had actually been filed in the legislature and had died a quick death because of what they tried to do. Um, I, I, we have gotten funding from outside because I think they've seen that Alaska could lead the way with a state-of-the-art election system that actually turns the state around and turns the state of partisanship away from destroying uh, our state, our country, our civil discourse. We are fighting upstream. It's true, um, we have more funds. But of course, no on two has the official support of political parties. And those are powerful entities that are fighting back to keep their power. We are fighting against the parties to some degree and we'll keep fighting. And we will put every message out that we can to reach Alaskans because we think when we deliver that mass message, Alaskans will wanna take this power back. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so the next uh, question uh, is to be posed by Scott or Andrew, and you have one minute to state your question. Great, thank you. Um, this obviously would be for Brett as the campaign manager. Uh, good evening, Brett. Um, as the campaign manager, uh, you are responsible for running the campaign, right? You, the buck or the bucks in this case stop with you. Five days ago, Alaska's campaign watchdog agency found you guilty of violating campaign finance laws while you were running three weeks worth of television ads. That means, Brett, that the campaign you are running against reforming election laws broke election laws while telling Alaskans there was no reason to reform election laws. That's, that's quite a feat. The, the agency called your personal actions, and I will quote from official te testimony, a ruse and went on to say your ads were, and I quote again from the official testimony, wildly inaccurate. Question, how do you try and continue to claim the high ground to argue against dark money disclosure when you yourself tried skirting existing APOC rules okay. regarding dark money disclosures? Okay, thank you. And Brett, you have two minutes for your response. Brett and Anna, you have two minutes for your response. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity for this question. As for us, we followed advice from APOC staff and that was overturned by the APOC commission. We followed the ruling and changed our disclaimer which had Mark Begich as a supporter, he remains a supporter. Now let's remind everyone the, the, of the question that comes back to you, Andrew, and that's, your group is called Yes on Two for Better Elections and let you continually represent yourself as Alaskans for better elections, despite the fact that Alaskan is no longer part of your official name, nor is your campaign funded by Alaskans. Why should Alaskans take your proposed reform seriously when you're violating election law and misrepresenting your campaign to the public? The exact thing you claim ballot measure two will stop. Okay, a lot to unpack there. Um, so just, let's just, just one second. Andrew, sure. just one second. Um, you still have a minute. So anything from you on that, Anna? No? Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. You have a minute. Great. Thanks. Um, a lot to unpack there, but let's actually start with the facts. And everybody on this call can go to APOC and look. Mm -hmm. The APOC staff testified that they had told you that your plan was not acceptable. In fact, Brett, if it would have been acceptable and the staff would have pre-approved it, you would have been found guilty of violating. So if we're gonna play the name game, how in the world can you call your group defending Alaska's elections when you're breaking election laws? Let's move on to the next thing. I myself have given to this campaign. A lot of Alaskans have given to this campaign. So while both campaigns, and I think it is the, the, the you bring up a great point, we're living in a world of Citizens United where there is dark money. Our attempt 
is to able to flush that out and take it from dark money into transparency. So I think if we're gonna throw stones here, I, I think you need to be careful before you pick up those stones because okay. of both sides of this ballot measure, your side is the only side that has been found guilty okay. of breaking the laws that you are now against reforming. Okay, um, Brett and Anna, you have one minute for a final answer. Yeah, I figured it was a long shot that you'd ask the question about your misleading of Alaskans, Andrew, but I can tell you again, and please, everybody look at the APOC decision. We're doing our best to comply. I called the APOC staff and asked them about the disclaimer. I was advised by Mr. Lucas, their attorney, that is my source of advice, that what we were doing was fine. The, and he testified to that during the hearing. The APOC commissioners in their ruling said, we disagree with the staff's advice. I followed the staff's advice. When that changed to APOC commissioners having a different feeling, I immediately followed their advice. We're doing all we can to participate in a fair and reasonable election process against Goliath and their $5.8 million. Anything further from you, Anna? No, okay. Um, let's see, Brett and Anna, you now have one minute to pose a question to the other side. Thank you, Thea. Um, Scott or Andrew, um, you talked about the involvement of Alaskans, so I really would like to hear about which groups um, you involved. I, I try to watch the paper uh, for places and opportunities that I can find out information as well. This is a huge document, 25 pages. Um, our opening described why it was like that, but um, can you talk about who you reached out to and who was um, part of the conversation that helped develop this process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, got an, you got two minutes, Scott and Andrew. Yeah, and I think that one, uh, apologies to Andrew, but I think that one's directed kind of specifically at me. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, it was Alaska grown, it was Alaska conceived. Um, I spoke with probably a good dozen people. I will say some of those people are members of both parties. Some of those people don't want to be named because they believe it will end their career even to challenge the parties. But I will say, for example, people who, who I, I vetted these ideas with and worked with are as diverse as Bruce Patello. He was attorney general, uh, you know, uh, he's a prominent Democrat. And people who I think, you know, Senator McKinnon, even you have a ton of respect for people like Sheldon Fisher who's a conservative, who's a businessman, and everyone agreed across the spectrum, hey, the system's broke. I might not say it out loud, some of them have, but the system is broken. We're not getting good outcomes for anyone. So bipartisan support that has agreed, hey, we've had a fiscal uh, crisis for six or eight years, and for some reason we can't fix it. Is it because you can get reelected in perpetuity by pointing at the other side? Likely it is. So again, um, written in Alaska by Alaskans, based largely on bills that had been filed in the Alaska legislature, drafted by Ledge Legal, that we then took uh, elements from and adapted, because of course, you know, the reason this is a ballot measure and not a law is because you can't expect a legislature that's elected under the current system, and the majority of which are beholden to one party or the other, to make this change. This is a change that could only come from the voters. So it really is grassroots, believe it or not. It really is bipartisan, believe it or not. I've got many, many people who love what I'm doing from both parties. I've got many, many people from both parties who hate what we're doing here. But the truth is, it's from Alaska. It really is. Well, uh, yes. thank you. Yeah, I'll take it first, and then I'll leave it to Brett. Brett, um, Scott, that's not my understanding. Uh, we can pull chunks of it out from other uh, spots in our country. And there's a national wave going on of this particular group and these particular people that are donating money uh, to try to affect change in, in states that have small populations to bring this experiment into. And uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. I, I wasn't invited into the conversation, I believe in process. When I was a committee chair, we heard those bills, we processed those bills through and we sent them to the floor. Certainly not all bills. I, um, I know that there's controversy about other things, but I, I try to act in the best interest of Alaskans on, the, on those corners, and that is a process. 
I, I would just add that anytime there's such an extensive rewrite of our laws, Alaskans deserve to be a part of the process of crafting it, right? It's fair to say that this, that this didn't occur with this initiative. They okay, got on the phone. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. I heard yeah. the tone, Thea. Yeah, oh, good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then, um, Scott, you have a minute for a final answer on that one. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> and I agree with Brett. This is ideally this would go through the legislature. The truth is, ballot measures have to be filed before the legislative session, so the legislature can take action. The legislature didn't touch this. There are times when the people have to enact laws by initiative. We wouldn't have financial disclosures for our public officials, but for a public, but for a public initiative. We wouldn't have, believe it or not, Alaska had a period of time where there were no campaign limits. You could give $100,000 to an elected official for their campaign. We wouldn't have those limits without ballot measures. So sometimes the people have to say, ethically, we have to, you know, for ethics, for financial disclosures, we have to step forward and we have to impose our will upon the legislature. And this is one of those moments. There is a national wave, um, as Senator McKinnon points out, but there may be a national wave because frankly, the two political parties are often serving up candidates no one wants, and they're pulling the party, the, the country apart in the process. So if there is a feeling in Alaska that we're on the wrong track, that feeling seems to be spreading nationwide. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all. So uh, now uh, the second question uh, for that Andrew and Scott can pose, you have one minute to pose your question. I'll start the timer when you start. Yeah, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm taking this one. So ballot measure two, specifically, not ranked choice voting and not studies cherry picked from across the country, but ranked choice voting and the, the, the suite of reforms in ballot measure two have been studied by the League of Women Voters of Alaska for six months. Tana Chiefs, who runs a robust get out the native vote effort, studied it for nearly a year. They've both endorsed it. The Sightline Institute did a months long study and they posted that to their website, a, a nonpartisan think tank. They didn't, they didn't endorse a yes vote, but they've produced information showing the benefits that could come from the reform. The Libertarian Party, Green Party, Independent Speaker, Bryce Edgman have all endorsed. So my question to either one of you on the team is what nonpartisan trusted entities, not political, not partisan entities, what nonpartisan trusted entities have studied ballot measure two, this measure, and have concluded that there should be a no vote? Okay, Brett and Anna, you have two minutes for your response. Scott, thank you for the question. So yes, there's many people have studied this and made a pick and you're asking for somebody nonpartisan. So take a look at our 33 co-chairs, please, people attending. Go to the Defend Alaska election site and see how many people are a no vote on this from every political view, from every political spectrum. Undeclared independence, read the op-eds that have been produced by our, by our co-chairs. So, so I would say that we have the labor union IBW that has studied this issue for quite some time. They're a no. We have, um, we have former lieutenant governors that are a no. We have a former division of directions elect elect division of elections director, Josie Bonke Hardy Scott that served with you. She's a no vote. That's somebody that knows a lot about how our elections work and is deathly afraid of what this measure would do. So certainly you can look at the Alaska Policy Forum. You can look at the Maine Policy Forum. You can look at many think tanks and they have determined that this is not in the best interest of Alaska, but it's really up to the Alaskan voters to decide. This isn't about politics. When you get down to the core, this is about people. This is people's, the individual's chance to reach out and actually touch their government. And their vote needs to matter, it needs to count, it needs to be fair, and people have to have some surety that when they show up to the polls, all of those things are in place. Thank you. Anna, anything you wanna to add to that? No, just that I see Sharon Cisna, Representative Cisna online, and we used to sit next to each other, so I want to recognize her in the crowd. Great. Okay, uh, Scott or Andrew, you have one minute for a follow-up. Yeah, I would. I would just quickly say um, I heard. A, I heard a lot of. I heard a few names there. Um, I didn't hear about an entity. I didn't hear about anyone actually studying this measure with some academic rigor and determining as you have individually have determined that it's the wrong way for Alaska. I heard you list some names and I appreciate that. You have supporters, we have supporters, but again, 
Alaska Policy Forum, I don't believe by anyone's measure would would qualify as a nonpartisan entity, nor am I even aware of them saying anything other than vote no. I'm not aware of a study that shows mathematically, geographically, demographically, there's no data. There's no data to back up what you say. The truth is a yes on two will lead to more democratic results, better governance, and candidates winning who have more support. Okay, Britt and Anna, you have one minute for a final, final on that one. So the idea that there's no data is just actually ludicrous. We've been presenting data. We have slides with data. We've been doing the research. We've talked to policy groups around the nation. We've talked to policy groups in our state. There is a ton of research on there that shows the problems with ranked choice voting. So the idea of um, either side having a monopoly on independent thought on this issue is just not the case. Again, this is about people. People are going to read this. They're going to look at this. They're going to determine this. And they're going to decide which way they want to go. So it's not about influencing them with who we know. It's about giving good information and letting Alaskans make their choice at the polls. And I would just add, um, Scott, it's very discouraging to watch what happens in other states as they've tried this. And, and they haven't tried it at other states. I mean, you, uh, the sponsors of this initiative are starting at the top, uh, affecting everyone. But um, not trying it at the municipal level, not seeing if people like it. In other states, they have turned it away. They've tried it for an election. They have not gotten the results that they wanted. They did not, they saw money spending going up and uh, choice going down. So, okay, thank you. Really thank you. Thanks. So, I think we actually do have time for another question from each side. So, let me start with um, Anna and Brett. Do you have a third question you would like to pose? And you, if so, you've got a minute to do that. You bet. Let's come back to this issue and lay some things to rest. So I'll take the question. Again, your group is called Yes on Two for Better Elections and let you continually misrepresent yourself as Alaskans for better elections. Despite the fact that Alaskan is no longer a part of your official name, nor is your campaign funded by Alaskans. Why should Alaskans take a proposed reform seriously when you're violating election law and misrepresenting your campaign to the public, the exact same thing, ballot measure two will stop. Okay, um, Scott and Andrew, you've got two minutes to respond. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, that was a curious comment. I'd, I'd be interested to hear Brett back up if, if in what way, in any way, we've ever violated the law. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, it's Alaskans for Better Elections. For purposes of our disclaimer, we're yes on two for better elections because you can fit that on a sign. Um, we are 100% Alaska grown, 100% Alaska staff. We have hundreds of donors. We have dozens and dozens of full, uh, endorsements from Alaskans. We've got, I mean, if we want to keep score, we've got magnitudes more endorsements than the no on two campaign. And truly, this is about, um, you know, Alaskans rising up. 62% of Alaskans don't affiliate with either party. And some members of the, you know, some current members of the party aren't real happy with how it goes either. So it's really about Alaskans taking their power back. We, we won't, um, we can't present people with the solutions to their problems. But what we can do is offer to all voters, here's a toolbox. Our democracy is struggling right now. Our policymaking is struggling right now. Here's a toolbox to make your elected officials more accountable to you and the will of all voters. And we're confident that Alaskans are going to rise up together and they're the ones who get to vote and they're going to decide to take that power for themselves. Because again, you cannot say this does anything but give more power and information to Alaska voters. That's all it does at the end of the day. And we think the voters are going to choose to take that power for themselves. Andrew, anything you want to add? you got like 20 seconds. Nope. Okay. Um, Brett and Anna, you have one minute to respond to that. Well, I figured it was a long shot that you'd actually answer the question, Scott. Um, now let's remind everybody what the original question was. Why do you think you should be above the law and mislead Alaskan voters by using a name that's not on your official group name? It's not okay to use it just because it fits on a sign. You know the law is clear. Your name has to be registered with APOC and you file filings under that name. You've not done so. You're calling yourself Alaskans for better elections after you changed your name in April. You're filing under 
yes on two for better elections. It's clearly a violation, Scott. And, and, and you know, you're using APOC as a tactic in this election, one of many of the tactics that we're not very pleased with. Um, again, please explain why it's okay for you to mislead voters and not just because it fits on a sign, please. Yeah, I guess I will answer that because I think, you know, you may not understand the law, Brett, and I don't mean this at all in a condescending way. I, the, truthfully, when a ballot measure, we were Alaskans for better elections, we proposed the ballot measure, we fought with the administration in court to be able to gather our signatures, we gathered our signatures, we fought again at the state Supreme Court, we won there, and we got certified from the ballot. And when we got certified for the ballot, the director of elections says, which ballot measure is which number? And when they say that, it is a requirement of state law that we include the ballot number in our name. We have to do that. So did we change our name in order to do that? We did because we have to to comply with the law. So again, a little confused of this rabbit trail we're going on, but 100% confident we're complying with the law and we'll continue to comply and go beyond compliance. Okay, thanks. Um, Last question uh, can be started by Scott and Andrew of uh, Brett and Anna. So you have one minute to state your question. Sure, um, thanks, Lee. I'll, I'll take this question. And I'm gonna direct it to Senator McKinnon because we're both former legislators and both policy people, and this is really kind of a policy question. Um, good evening, Senator McKinnon, it's good to see you. Um, less than 20% of the voters show up in a primary election. And in some highly partisan districts, only five to 10% of the electorate end up choosing who ultimately uh, represents them in Juneau. To add insult to low voter turnout, when those who do participate in a primary show up to vote, they're placed in a box by not allowing them to choose uh, uh, from a ballot of all candidates, just those in a particular party. So somebody like myself who might like my senator and not like my house member, you know, I I'm locked into one ballot. But the little known fact that is incredibly important is that the public pays the cost of primary elections. So that means the public is paying for political parties to limit their ballot choices. Andrew, please now, state your question. Sure. Uh, question is, uh, you've been a champion of getting good value for your dollar. Since the public is paying the cost of the primary election, why shouldn't the public get maximum value by having the entire slate of candidates to choose from instead of okay. getting shortchanged okay. by closed partisan primaries? Okay. I think we got your question. Okay, you have two minutes to respond, Anna. Well, for, first it's Anna now, so I appreciate those that um, give me the title. I, it's very humble. Thank you, Andrew. Um, but Anna for now, or Grandma. Um, the, the public uh, and what they pay for things uh, comes in the form of choice. Uh, from my perspective, I chose to be listed and run in the Republican primary because I believed in those values. And that gives the people that are coming to the polls an opportunity to at least know some of the basic values that someone has when they're running. Now what we see happening uh, is people entering and, and even in this ballot initiative, people can put whatever letter or number or whatever they want beside their name to try to flag to individual voters who they are without actually having to be them at all. So this this concept uh, that, the, that the public is paying, I think the public wants to know who the people are that they are running for, both on the Democratic side and on the Republican side, on Green Party, on Libertarian. They want to know what your core values are. And this, uh, what I've heard Brett say as a jungle primary, for, for me, it's just confusing overall. Um, I, I think that the people get what they want by having it, it uh, defined in a box that people are checking into willingly. I didn't go into that Republican box unwillingly. I went there because I believed in 95% of everything that was on that Republican Party platform in 1999 when I started uh, that race. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, Andrew, you have one minute to respond to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you, you know, I, I, I agree with you that, that voters want choice and they want to understand their candidates. But once they understand their candidates, they should have the freedom to choose those candidates. We live in a state where 60% of the voters are nonpartisan or unaffiliated. So, you know, for the 35% for the or, or so that, that are registered Republicans, I mean, they're driving the bus 
for the rest of the 60% that's not attached to a party. And so, you know, when, when we talk about voter affiliation, all of these things will still be there. Andrew Hopper will still be able to campaign as a Republican and still be able to, uh, to communicate with, with, with my constituents what I stand for. The difference is, is that when they go to the polls, they actually have a choice whether to vote for me or somebody else that might be running. So, you know, to, to, to me, your response is, 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 is really like, I agree with you. Voters need choices. But right now, when they show up at a primary, they are put in a box and okay. not given any choice. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, Anna, you have uh, the last minute. Um, trying to write it all down as quickly as I can. I, I think that voters have a, a choice and I think most voters in our state uh, poll a particular ballot that they want. And there are a few voters that feel disenfranchised because they want to vote on different tickets. Uh, so Andrew, I'll, I'll give you that, that there are some voters that feel like that, but how I've watched election results come out is a majority polls one particular ticket and this particular initiative is trying to pry into that and from my opinion, start stacking multiple people up in elections. And so those top four are going to look very different and very confusing for a l large portion of the population because you're going to have all of these voters uh, there that cannot be analyzed or will not be vetted in the same way that this the current primary process does. And I would like to have another entire discussion about uh, voter turnout and what I think about voter turnout and why those numbers are low. Great. Okay, that was great, panelists. That was, that's hard work, so maybe take a deep breath. Um, okay, because we're gonna go into our next uh, section of our discussion tonight. And so um, what we'll do here is we'll be hearing from the audience, not verbally, but Katie um, is a Alaska Common Ground board member and she's been looking at all the questions that the audience has been putting into the chat as you've all been speaking. And she's um, loading them into a Google document, which is over here. So when you see me look this way, that's what I'm looking at. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing these uh, questions with you, and I will pose them alternating from one side to the other. Um, and then you will have, so I'll pose it to one side. That side will have two minutes to respond, and then I'll give the other side two minutes to respond, and I'm going to alternate back and forth. Okay, so... Andrew posed the last question, so I'll, I'll give the first audience question to Brett and Anna. And the first, oh, actually though, well, let me see. I was gonna say the first question on the list is actually one that's probably easier for Scott or Aaron, Andrew to, to answer. So, uh, okay, actually, here's the second one on the list. Can the opposition explain to us the merits of candidates winning by plurality rather than a majority? Yeah, I'll take the first crack at that. Thank you, Thea. And okay, thanks. and you'll have two minutes for that. And thanks for the question. So, so yes, currently, you can select somebody in a race that uh, there, there might be three people in a race, there might be four people in a race, there might be two people in a race. If there's two people in a race, you're going to end up with a majority. If there's more than two, you're going to end up with a plurality in a first round of voting. What's the benefit of that? If I select a candidate that aligns with my views or any of the audience selects a candidate that aligns with their views, they work very hard to get that candidate elected. The candidate works very hard to talk to enough voters and get the most number of votes. That might be 46% in a three-way race. That's, substan that, that's a winner, right? That's a winner. Alaskans that are, that are supporting them, the candidate that's working for it, all those that are involved in the process have just elected a candidate. Unless we go to this contrived majority system where you almost have no chance of having a winner in the first round and will always be contrived. So that same person that got 46% that I voted for that aligned with me or you voted for and aligned with you under their system doesn't win. The other three shuffle around while your vote sits and to see if somebody passes the 50% mark. So it just makes, it takes surety away. It takes value from vote away. It takes somebody that runs or somebody that supports a candidate and says, even though they picked the winner, they still lost. That's not gonna increase turnout. Anna, anything you want to add to that? 
Uh, just that uh, the initiative that's before Alaska voters will not give a 50% plus one unless there's only two in the race. And uh, the, the measure actually says that you may receive, you know, a larger percentage uh, based on rank voting. It just depends on how many people uh, fill out all four particular numbers or how many people are in the race. Okay, Scott and Andrew, you have two minutes to respond. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick shot and try to leave some time for Andrew. Um, obviously, we agree with the premise of the question. Plurality voting is inferior to she majority the, voting. Um, director of the Division of Elections. Um, Oops, someone's, someone's not on mute. Oh, sorry. Um, so what, what the current system does says you answer to your base only. Imagine a system like our system we propose where you campaign to people outside your own party and outside your own base because you're going to have to represent them. The spoiler effect is real, and the spoiler effect acts in two ways. One, there's just the base spoiler effect. You might vote for someone, and you actually have the effect of electing the person that's the opposite of your views. Two closely aligned candidates in a race with a third candidate, these two candidates might have 70% support or close to, but they divide that support between them. So the candidate three might win with 37% support. 63% of that, that the state or the uh, district preferred someone else, and yet we end up with this perverse outcome. Worse than that still is the games that are played in the plurality system. The spoiler effect used to advantage. If I'm running against a Republican, I know if I get just a buddy to file as an AIP or a Libertarian, he will peel six or 7% off of the Republican and I can beat him or her. Likewise, if I'm running against a Democrat, I coax someone in to run as a, a Green Party or as an independent, they're going to peel support off and I'm going to win. Not because over 50% of the district supported me, but because I played games. End the games and put the system in place and we'll see what true majorities can do. Andrew, do you wanna add? You only have 20 seconds though. Sure, um, I'm a perfect example of that. About a hundred years ago, I ran for governor. It was a three ray race between myself, Sarah Palin and Tony Knowles. And I had dozens of people come up to me. As a matter of fact, I ran campaign ads the last two weeks saying, hey, I know I'm an independent, but it's okay to vote for me. And there's no question that voters, when, 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 when given the choice saying, I would like to vote for you, but I don't want Sarah to win, or I would vote for you, or I don't want Tony to win. It's okay. a real problem. And, and there's Thanks. no reason we should be limiting choices okay. of voters. Great, okay. Um, Brett and Anna, I'll give you two minutes to respond to that. I, I would just say that um, campaigning to your base uh, may not get you what you want Oops. if you're talking. Wait, to you. did I already do both sides? I did, didn't I? Okay, sorry. We need to go to the second question. Sorry about that, Anne. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get to share that thought in the next one. Okay. Okay, so this question is um, directed towards Scott and Andrew. Um, the question is, why is this one ballot measure rather than three separate ballot measures? So we'll give you two minutes to speak to that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take a, a quick run at that. So it's important to realize these things are very much interconnected. For example, an open primary. Well, if you do a top two open primary, you're limiting choices. So that wouldn't work for Alaska. We've got all sorts of political diversity of thought. But if you do a top four open primary like we have without the ranked choice voting, then you end up with people potentially winning with 31, 28%, and that's not optimal. So the, and, and likewise, the ranked choice voting, if you just put that into place, but you've got a system, a party primary system where they are the gatekeepers to the ballot, and largely they will control the two choices you have in most cases, that wasn't going to work either. So those two pieces act as a system together to produce one, here are the four, the final four, so to speak, that have the most support and are viable. And here's a system by which we can truly represent in the general election, the will of the majority. Now, all that being said, now we know that the political parties can't control the, uh, the election system anymore. So it's more important than ever that voters have adequate information. Everyone's gonna be trying to influence their vote. So the information piece in the dark money that says, if you're trying to influence my vote on a candidate, I'm gonna know your name. That's part and parcel of the whole program because the voters need that information. They can't go to the ballot, the ballot box anymore and say, I'm just going to vote straight R or straight D. They're going to have a variety of choices. And when they get information bombarded on them, 
They need to know where that information comes from. So again, it's a slight structural reform, but all the pieces are interlocked together just to give the voters more power and choices. And I'll yield to Andrew the remainder. Okay, it's only 15 seconds though. <laughs> Um, I'll go ahead and wave my time. Okay. <laughs> okay. As soon as, so, I open, as soon as I open my mouth, the bell's going to ring. So go. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So Brett and Anna, you have two minutes to respond to that question, or to or to respond to their response. Uh, I would just say that. Um, from my perspective, multiple initiatives would have been better. I don't think that it's fair to lump it all together. I do think Citizens United should be looked at. There's a lot of money coming in, but this initiative process is bringing a whole lot of money in. And I'm not an attorney, Scott, Andrew. I respect uh, the work that you do as an attorney, but 25 pages, I've tried to read it. I need the state statute books to go back and read to understand. Uh, what's going on in all of these different things. Uh, dark money is bringing some yes votes your way, but I don't think that it's, it's genuine in, in its sense that it doesn't take care of what's happening in this particular process to, to influence our voters. Go ahead, Beth. And I would, I would just add to that, that, that it, it would have definitely been better off in three pieces, but you've noticed that they're claiming 81% of Alaskans don't like dark money. They're using $5 million of dark money to scare Alaskans about that dark money. And they're exempting themselves from the dark money provisions. I think that piece is in there because it's their loss leader. We all want campaign transparency. We all want to know who's, who's donating to candidates. I don't think any Alaskan feels differently than that or any elected official feels differently than that. Let's deal with that issue and not try to use it as a loss leader to put these other failed experiments in our shopping cart. Okay, let's go to the next audience question. And this question is for, um, for Anna and Brett. The question is, is the current system the best possible? If not, how do we get there? Why not pass ballot measure two, then evaluate how well it works and let the legislature amend it? And you have two minutes for your response to that. You want me to go first, Brett? <laughs> that's, that's fine, I've kept my mic off. I do think the legislature should go first, period. Um, we, we can't even have in a conversation tonight uh, something that is meaningful in the form of taking the sections apart and looking at a sectional analysis and then bringing the different groups that will be adversely affected to the table. I think about seniors. I think about that because I've got gray hair, I'm over 60 and uh, things are getting uh, different for me when I go forward looking at things. And so, you know, change, I have to think about it just a little bit longer. And I think that we're going to disenfranchise some of our seniors uh, I think that uh, those that speak a different language are going to have a hard time adapting to a new system. If we would have had a process that we could have thought about it, that we could have debated, that we could have disagreed, but not be disagreeable, um, would have been a benefit to bring this forward. There are concepts in here that I think are worthy of debate. We're just not going to have the opportunity given a pandemic, Zoom meetings, and uh, the stress that is on all of our families to actually fairly vet this piece of legislation and that scares me. I am here as an individual. I am not here as someone from any particular party. Okay, Brett, you still have about 40 seconds if you want to add to anything. I don't know how I say it a whole lot better than Anna just did. Um, nothing is perfect, but the process that we have is understood, it's understandable. The instruction manual is two sentences long, fill in the oval and fill it in completely. When Maine adopted this, their, their instruction book was 19 pages long. It is not an easy system. Change is difficult, especially when you find change in something that people have expected surety in. Um, this is a wholesale change, not trying it out, not taking a piece of it, a wholesale change to our entire election law, and this isn't the way it should happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Um, Scott and Andrew, your opportunity to respond to that audience question. Do you yeah, have uh, question? Sure. I'd, I'd, I'd like to I'd jump in here. You know, as a former legislator, I, I always love this conversation. You know, you, first you make people afraid of it and then you tell them how confusing it is and how worried you are. 
you know, the bottom line is that if Alaskans sat around and waited for the state legislature to address these, yeah, even one by one, it would never get done. Never. If the legislature was so concerned about efficiency, we'd have legislative term limits. We did for like four years until the legislature repealed them. Matter of fact, myself and Vic Coring were the only ones who voted against repealing voluntary term limits. The reality is political parties want to protect the existing system. As a matter of fact, on the record during testimony, Glenn Clary, the chair of the Republican Party's quote was, this will make political parties extinct. There is, there, there is, there is, I love the concern about how this should go through the legislative process, but every fundamental change in the last 30 years that have been adopted by the state of Alaska on behalf of citizens have been done through the ballot initiative. I can't remember one time when the legislature took up something like campaign finance reform, except to weaken it. So while we would love to have a perfect functioning legislature that addresses all of these things and makes the improvement themselves, the reality is those same political parties want to keep this current system because it forces you into one lane. It forces you into voting a straight ballot ticket. That's the reality. Okay, thank you. Um, I think if we keep going, we'll have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's one we'll start that I'm gonna to direct towards Andrew and Scott to start off with. The, the audience member says, I like ranked choice, but I'm nervous about the open primary. If we don't guarantee representation for different points of view on the general election, then I would rather eliminate the primary altogether. What's the point of narrowing the choices? So two minutes for your response and then we'll go to Brett and Anna. So the, the, the narrowing the choices is sort of a viability test. If a candidate can't muster the 12%, 15% or so to make it into the final four, then you know, the voters would simply be overwhelmed with choices. Um, we, we have studied other systems and other systems that have had no primary will have 15, 20, 25 candidates and the voting becomes meaningless at that point. Now in Alaska, of course, we are, uh, we're comfortable with that many. We often get um, Green Party, Libertarian Party, we get these other party candidates. So the, the reason is, one, allow for that diversity of thought, but two, make it manageable for the voter because we do have to make an experience where they can get their arms around it. The good news is for the concerns of this voter, is if they're concerned about minority political views, well, we are endorsed by the Libertarian Party. We are endorsed by the Green Party because they see right now in the status quo, they may not be able to show up. They'll have to go gather signatures and their affiliation may not even show up on the ballot. So this allows them to fly their flag proudly, appear on the ballot as they wish to. And if they can muster enough to be in the top four, they get to go onto the general election. And that gives more variety and more choices to the voters. Andrew, about 40 seconds. Do you want to add anything? I, I don't have anything to add. I, I think Scott pretty much nailed it. Okay, so Anna and Brett, you have two minutes to respond to that. Uh, thanks, Thea. I, I, I would just uh, see it very differently. I think that the majority parties, um, if this were to pass, is going to solicit multiple candidates and they are going to have the money and everyone is going to be treated the same. They're going to be pushed out and people are going to be very confused. Um, you are not going to understand who is there. You're not, if, if, if we take uh, what Scott, I believe it was Scott that said that you will speak to a broader base and you will try to uh, get that base to vote for you uh, you're not going to know what these candidates are really going to do when they get there because they haven't been tested by fire. They haven't had the really rough questions because they're they're answering in the middle of everything. But but that that's just me, Andrew. I, I, I can see your face, so you know I, I know you're you're responding. But that that's just a personal view. That that's how, that that's why I am uh, um, skeptical of of ranked choice. America has the best voting system in in the world. People migrate here. Immigrants are uh, afloat on waters trying to get to us. And that, that voting, that democracy that they're seeking, that freedom, 
uh, is because of the one vote and understanding where that one vote will take you, that somebody else isn't going to game the system. Brett, anything to add? You just have about 30 seconds. You're on mute, Brett. You're on mute. Thank you. I appreciate, thank you, Anna, and I appreciate everybody's perspective on this. Again, I would suggest that Alaskans choose diversity. In this very election cycle, there are 16 candidates running for state office that are either unaffiliated or undeclared. So that 60% you talk about have candidates in the race. They can choose either ballot to select. Everybody gets to see all of the votes in the general election. Our system is the best in the world. This is a huge departure and a dangerous experiment at a time when we can't afford it. Okay, um, let's just go for it and do one more question, okay? So here's, this one's gonna start with Brett and Anna. Um, if ballot measure two succeeds, this is a little bit of a long question, so I can repeat it when we get to Scott and, and Andrew if you want. If ballot measure two succeeds, how will it affect the Republican and Democratic parties? And if it fails, what, if anything, can the parties promise Alaskan voters in regards to the concerns ballot measure two has made, as it has brought up, such as dark money, gridlock in Juno, and disenfranchised voters who cannot participate in the primaries? So Brett and Anna, you start, and then we'll come over to Scott and Andrew. I'll start with that one, Anna. You've been, you've been taking the lead on a lot of these, so let me give it a try. The question is, what will the parties do? The question is, how will it affect the parties? That question is honestly better posed of the representatives of the parties. You know that you've had the chair of the Republican Party say that he's not in favor of ballot measure two. You know you've had prominent Democrats and a former chair of the party say they're not in favor of ballot measure two. So what can the parties do? The parties can continue to um, make sure that, that candidates do go through a crucible, that questions are asked that people have an understanding of, of, of who they're voting for and why. Um, parties, I think, have the opportunity to, to play an important role in Alaska in that regard. Um, all parties have a chance to the ballot. If somebody wants to go directly to the general election ballot, you can do that in Alaska. You can get any party there. This actually provides less choice in that regard. And I think the question's better posed of the Republican and Democratic Party, Thea, quite frankly. And anything to add? Uh, I, I just you know, they'll fight for survival, right? Um, and I, I think Brett has it right that, um, that you should ask them that. But um, anything that's alive, whether it's a bureaucracy, an organization or whatever, will fight for survival. And uh, I've pointed out one thing where I think the parties then will run a multitude of candidates and it's going to become very confusing and it's going to become very expensive for all parties. And the winner is gonna be the media who tends to like to take sound bites from both sides of an argument and only run the sound bites. And democracy requires digging deeper into these issues. And, and you've, they've been brought up here tonight. Thank you for the question. Okay. Scott and Andrew, do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, please. I, yeah, please. Okay. Um, if ballot measure two succeeds, how will it affect the Republican and Democratic parties? If it fails, what, if anything, can the parties promise Alaskan voters in regards to the concerns ballot measure two has raised in our discourse, such as dark money, gridlock in Juneau, and disenfranchised voters who cannot participate in the primaries? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a run at this and try to leave time for Andrew. Um, how will it affect the parties if it passes? They won't be gatekeepers to the ballot anymore. That will be true. They won't own two slots on the ballot that they can, even after the primary, swap candidates into if they wish. They won't have that power anymore. And they won't control public officials once elected. Those public officials will answer only to their constituents. They'll care about their party. They'll want to turn out their party base and support, but they won't be completely controlled by it like the current system allows. However, they will continue to have their free speech and associational rights. They can go through their own internal processes, they can endorse whatever candidates they want. They can spend money to support them, but we're not gonna subsidize their selection of their own candidates anymore. <clears throat> that will end. Now, if it fails, um, that's a scary question because look at the record. The parties who largely control the Capitol had 10 years to fix dark money. I don't recall any serious effort to fix it. They've had over 20 years to fix closed primaries. 
there's been no serious effort to fix it. We had to enact automatic voter registration by ballot measure because the, le the legislature wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't touch something that would automatically register every Alaskan to vote. Sometimes the people have to stand up for what's right and what will give them power. And we think that's why it's critically important and why ballot measure two represents a generational chance to change the trajectory that we're on, a trajectory that by and large, almost all Alaskans agree we're on the wrong track. You have 30 seconds, Andrew, if you wanna add. Yeah, sure. I, I'd like to take a second part of that. I, I, I mean, first off, you know, the 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 idea that um, the the idea that somehow voters are now suddenly not going to understand the candidates and their positions. I mean, you know, really, all we have to do is look at the scorecard. I mean, the the alternative is is for 25 years we have known and listened to this same limited group of candidates telling us what they're doing, and the state of Alaska is one year away from running out of money. So okay. I mean, if for yep. anything else, this process will get voters more okay. involved. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, now each side gets two minutes for their closing statements. So we're coming to the end here and we're going to start the closing statements. Uh, Anna, and you have two minutes. Thank you, Fian. Thank you for everyone who is participating tonight. And thank you for those that um, have brought this idea uh, before us to debate. <laughs> is an experiment. Uh, it hasn't been tried before. This is the first time ever for a four uh, fill in the dot. Never before has any state made this sweeping of a change in how that we would conduct our elections. Alaska elections are working. We know that we have a fair and transparent process that's easy to understand. We don't always like what comes out, but we expect, accept it and we move on. That's what Senator Baggage did. That's what uh, Governor Parnell did. These two disagreed on many issues, but they've both shown through their careers in and out of office that they care deeply about our state. Uh, both have lost elections uh, with two of the hot, from two of the highest offices, and they both oppose this crazy, crazy scheme and believe Alaskans should control our own destiny and not money from outside our state. Alaskans, be ready. These billionaires don't like to lose. They are funding this campaign. Uh, you will see lots of shiny objects for us to look at and admire, but in every um, one of those objects, there is a trick, and Alaskans are smarter than that. We uh, don't need to see the Facebook's ads or misleading uh, advertisement or false poll results that don't tell how polls were taken or more of the same. We need Alaskans to engage in the process. I have faith in Alaskans. I know that we can work these issues out. We can disagree about things respectfully and make changes that will benefit all of us. If you can't be assured that this new idea is the best thing for Alaska, then you should be voting no. This particular format uh, sets up a debate when really we need to be looking and processing what the idea is in that proposal. Again, Thea, I thank think you. I hear a bell. So thank yep. you for joining us and please vote now. Okay, thank you, Anna. And now Scott, you will have two minutes to make your closing. Um, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna do oh, that. Andrew, uh, okay, do sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Thanks, sorry about uh, first I wanna, I wanna take a couple of seconds and apologize to Anna. I wasn't laughing at what you were saying. Your comments made me uh, remember a funny political story of actually somebody we both served with. Um, anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for this evening. Um, the, the strategy for opposing ballot initiatives is, is textbook. First you sue, you try and keep it off the ballot and keep people from voting. And then the second thing, if that fails, then the second thing is you, you make them afraid of it. You know, you tell them all the things that are gonna be wrong with it. Um, first, uh, th these folks opposing ballot measure two went to court. Um, they the Supreme Court ruled unanimously uh, the governor had the Department of Law run this case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled unanimously that uh, this should go on the ballot. And then the, the Supreme Court handed the state a bill for $100,000 of public money, which means the public paid a hundred grand for the courts to tell them to let them be able to vote on something. Um, in addition, so once that failed, they are trying to make you afraid of it. You know, when they, you know, when they couldn't stop you from voting in court, they switched gears and, and are now trying to make you afraid of dark money and lost votes and everything that this will actually fix. You know, what they've been saying is that it's fine, it doesn't need to be fixed. But yet 
they are the only side of this ballot initiative that has been found guilty of violating campaign finance laws. In fact, I, I would repeat that the APO sta st staff testified that they told Brett exactly that they didn't approve of what he was doing before he did it. My fellow Alaskans, we are in this together. And right now we need an election system that puts power in the hands of voters, not political parties who seek to continue controlling the progression of candidates through the primary and then on to the general. This is not a silver bullet, but it is a much needed start to begin reweighting the election process in favor of all Alaskans. Thank you for your time tonight. Stay well, stay safe, and please vote yes on ballot measure two. Great, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all four of our panelists uh, for all you've shared this evening. And thank you so much to all of you who have joined and also provided so many great questions. Uh, we're almost out of time. We would like to return now to hear from the audience again through the poll. So again, we'd like to ask the same question we asked at the beginning, and you can remember at the beginning, 52% uh, answered yes and 48% answered no, almost 50-50. Um, so again, please answer the, the, the polling question on your screen. Did tonight's discussion help you decide how to vote on ballot measure two? Oops, it's not exactly the same as what we asked before. So anyway, we'll see what, see what you said here. And while we're uh, tabulating that, or maybe we're gonna just wait, wait to do that. So we'll see what happened. Lots of people here. Okay, put your clicks on. Put your votes in on the poll. And I think- Lots of people are saying thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. okay, I think you can probably cut, cut off the, the poll now. Absolutely, and, and thanks for Common Grounds, the work it took to put this together. We sure appreciate, we sure appreciate having this forum. Well, it looks like from the poll that this was very helpful. Um, we've gone from about half half people um, not knowing how they were going to vote to um, almost almost all everyone ninety four percent saying that it helps them decide how to vote. So that's that's great. Thank you so much for all you've shared, and I'm going to uh, pass it on back to Dick to close us up tonight. Hey, uh, first off, I really want to thank Thea for doing a great job moderating tonight's event. And I want to thank Scott, Brett, Andrew, and Anna for a very informative and civil discussion of the matter. Um, missing from this Zoom meeting is the applause that you would normally be hearing if we were doing this in person. <laughs> um, special thanks to Kari Gardy, who has been running the Zoom show behind the scenes and did much of the legwork needed to plan for and carry out this event. And she was assisted by Common Ground board members, Hannah Laird, Alyssa Bish, and Katie Doherty, who are also working behind the scenes. Thank you again for your support and thank you for attending. If you're not a member of Alaska Common Ground, please go to our website and join or donate. Alaska Common Ground depends on individuals' donations to make it possible for us to carry out events such as this. Um, you can join or donate at akcommonground.org or there should be a link appearing on the chat bar right now. With that, I'll end tonight's discussion. Please stay healthy, stay engaged. We hope to see you all in person soon, and we hope you all get out and vote, either get those absentee or early votes in, or go to the polls on November the 3rd. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Good night.